Adam's still on my way to heaven. I'm glad still. Uh, God knows where I'm at. Amen. I was talking to somebody today, but not today, this week. And we was talking about when they got saved and, and uh, talking about when they got older. And I was telling them about people, people right here in our congregation. I said, years ago, we did a testimony thing. <clears throat> and I asked folks to fill out their testimony, write their testimony. And I said, now, years later, I've come back and I talked to them. They said, well, you know, I don't remember, remember exactly what year it was. And I said, well, I do. I remember when you filled that thing out, I wrote it down. When you got saved, well, tell me, preacher. And I tell them, oh, there's just so thrilled. I forgot. I just tell you, I've gotten so old now. I, I just don't remember just right off the bat. I can go look it up, but I just don't remember. I, I said, listen, that's something wonderful about that. When I can't remember, when I can't even get to where maybe one of these days I don't even know who I am, I'm glad he still knows who I am. <laughs> Woo! I just had a little shout smell this week. Amen. When, when I don't even know who I am, I'm glad he knows who I am. That's what it's all about. I'm glad he knows me. Oh, I'm telling you, that's the most important thing. He knows me. Let's pray together. Ask the Lord to meet with us in a mighty way. We're in for a good time. I'm glad the Lord's with us today. Father, thank you so much for the privilege to come and meet with your people. And Lord, I just want to praise you that you're here today and you want to meet with us. Lord, I'm glad. I'm so glad. As the psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And Lord, I'm glad you're here, wanting to bless us, wanting to speak to our hearts, wanting to do a work in our lives that only you can do. I ask you, Lord, you'd bless this service. You know what we stand in need of. You know the ones that wanted to be here. And Lord, couldn't. Circumstances, sickness, other things, Lord, just hindered them from being here. Their desire. I talked to them many times, some of our shut-in folks. Uh, all through the week, Lord, sometimes I talk to them and they tell me, oh, preacher, I, I wish I could be there. I think about y'all every Sunday morning. I think about y'all. I pray for y'all. I thank you, Lord, that they're praying even now and thinking about us. Some watching online, but Lord, I just want to praise you uh, for the ones that are here, for the opportunity to come. And Lord, I know some were hampered because of other things, but Lord, I praise you that you're here and you want to meet with us. And uh, more, many times that we even desire in our hearts to meet with you. You have a desire to meet with us and flood our souls and speak to us and meet our needs. Lord, I pray that you do that in a real way today. You know the hearts and lives and needs of every person. And Lord, I'm glad you're able to meet those needs in accordance to your own perfect will. Bless us now. Speak to us and speak through us. We'll praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen, amen. All right, Brother Dale's going to come. We're going to sing some more good songs. Amen. Okay, let's stand, guys. Hallelujah. 265. Hallelujah. Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. Good morning. Love lifting. Yes, sir. Something about that love lifting. Something like it. Amen.
240, we'll do uh, verse 1 and verse 3 of when the road is called up yonder. Hallelujah. Some glorious morning sorrow will cease. Some glorious morning all will be peace. Heartaches all ended, school days all done. Heaven will open, Jesus will come. Some golden day break, Jesus will some golden day break, battles all won. He'll shout the victory, break through the blue. Some golden day break for me, for you. Oh, what a meeting there in the skies. No more to sorrows to dim our eyes. Loved ones united eternally. Oh, what a daybreak that morn will be. Some golden daybreak, Jesus will come. Some golden daybreak, battles all. Shout the victory, break through the blue. Some golden day break for me, for you. Amen. Right. If you have your Bibles with you, you can open them to the book of Genesis. Book of Genesis, so good to have all these folks with us this morning. Good to see all of you here. Glad you're here in the house of the Lord. I want to read some verses and start, I guess, a series of sermons. I don't know how far we'll go, but I've been mapping out and praying now for several months. Uh, a simple look at prophecy. A simple look at prophecy. I want to uh, begin uh, this morning and read some verses in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter number 12. If you're able and can stand with me. Genesis chapter number 12. Unusual place to read concerning prophecy, but I want to read these three verses 
And then we'll begin to look at a simple look at prophecy. The Bible says here in Genesis chapter number 12, beginning with verse number 1, Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Father, now I ask that you would open to, the, to us today your word, and our hearts, and our minds. Lord, would you show us what you have for us and speak to us in a real way. We'll be careful to praise you and thank you for all that you do in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to look for a few moments here in the Word of God. I love great mystery movies. Now, it's hard to find good ones today, so I watch an old, old ones more than I do new ones. And Karen and I will sometimes watch them. She'll find one occasionally that's worth watching. And sometime I'll walk in right in the middle of it. And I'll say, what you watching? She says, it's pretty good. You need to watch it. And I said, well, okay. Uh, what's it about? And she'll start telling me. And she'll, she'll start in the middle of it, you know, or whatever. And, and she'll tell me, you know, uh, John and Joe or Susie, you know, uh, 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 that's Carol. And she, Susie's got Carol's ring, and she got it. Thanks, you got it uh, while at, at, Su at Joe's, uh, Susie's funeral. Took it off to Susie at the funeral home or something, you know. And, I, man, I'm right in the middle of it. And before I know it, you know, I don't know. What does Susie and Carol, what is Susie doing with Carol's ring? And. And what does John doing with a million dollars trying to hide it down there? And they're over in Italy trying to hide it in some old uh, vineyard over there. And before I know it, you know, I'm trying to keep catch up with the story. And, and I asked her another question. She said, I, I'll, I'll start it over. I said, no, 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 don't, don't start it over. Don't start it over because I'm thinking, I don't have time today to sit here and watch this whole thing. And she wants to start it over. And then she's going to be disappointed when I get up and walk out in the middle of this thing. And I said, I'll catch up with it later. I, I love those old things, you know, sometimes some of those old movies. And she'll start trying to tell me, well, let's just back it up. And I said, no, 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 I'll catch up with it later. And, and she's already watched so much of it that she don't want to go back, really. And she don't want to start over. But it's right in the middle of it. And, boy, it's so intriguing. She's caught up right in the middle of it. I guess one of my favorite TV shows of all times, of course, Andy Griffith is, is, is number one, I guess, that and Little House of Prayer. But, but outside of that, as far as mystery is old, uh, excuse me, ma'am, what, 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 I, you, got a, you got a pencil? I, I don't have a pencil. Pulls out his little notepad, that old trench coat. Uh, uh, just one more question. Excuse me, just one more question. Y'all know who I'm talking about. Oh, Ricky Grinning. Oh, Columbo. He had a way about him. Boy, he could solve those crimes, couldn't he? And he'd catch them, man. They'd, they'd say something. And he'd say, what got me was when you said so-and-so, there's no way that could fit. There's no way that could fit with the rest of the story that you're trying to, to, sell, to sell there, or right, trying to tell there. And, and, of course, he always had a way about him. And, and of course, all this, you know, in mystery, and all that in suspense, uh, them old radio shows, I've listened to a bunch of them. They're, they're pretty intriguing. Suspense used to come on the radio. I don't know if you've ever even heard of that radio show. I never did know it growing up. We never did listen to none of that stuff growing up, but I've listened to them since they got grown. Suspense and The Whistler, that was an old radio show you'd listen to. Some of y'all shaking your head, you're telling your age. <clears throat> Just kidding. But, but they're intriguing. Now, if you want to make sense out of prophecy, some people do that. You know, it's like buying a book and you want to read this story or read about this movie or whatever or watching a movie. You jump right in the middle of it and say, what's going on? What's going on? What, what's this, that, and the other? I have people ask me today. There's nothing wrong with it. I, by the way, it's, it's good. I, I'm glad people ask me, what do you think about this Russia thing? I said, it's right there in the book. Well, tell me about it. I'm thinking... It's going to be hard for me to tell you right in the middle of this story what it's all about. Because it ain't going to make sense to you. You're asking me to jump right in the middle of this mystery, or right in the middle of this suspense, and tell you the whole story. And it won't make sense. And that's the reason a lot of people have trouble with prophecy. It's because they're trying to jump right in the middle of the book and trying to make sense out of the whole story. If you want to know the story... 
It starts with a promise. That's where it starts, with promise. That's where the whole story, the whole thing of prophecy starts with promise. That's what I want to look at today. A simple look at promise. A simple look at prophecy starts with a promise. Promises, promise, promises, and promises. And who made them and who do you make them to? And what's it all about? It started, of course, with a promise of God's coming. Now, if you want to make sense out of the Bible, the place to start is not the last book of the Bible, Revelation of Prophecy. It's not in the middle of the Bible, Ezekiel or Daniel. It's actually going back to the beginning. If you really want to make sense out of prophecy, go back to the beginning where it all starts and make it all work together because God don't just haphazardly throw things around and say, you figure it out. God's got the plan, and it's a good plan. Amen. And he shows it to us, and it's pretty clear. You see, the Bible, the Bible starts in Genesis. The word itself means beginnings, and it starts with a promise. It started with a promise coming. You remember in the book of Genesis, it's easily, easily broken down in our spiritual roots. The book of Genesis, we find, of course, when you study the book of Genesis, uh, that uh, there's some landmark events that take place in the book of Genesis. When we walk through the Bible, in our study on Wednesday night several years ago, we walked through the entire Bible book by book. And the book of Genesis is easily broken down into two parts, chapters 1 through 11 and then chapters 12 through 50. In chapters 1 through 11, it covers uh, main events, four main events take place in chapters 1 through 11. And then chapters 12 through 50 deal with four main characters. Simple break, break it, breaking down of outlines. The first four main events are creation, the fall of man, Noah and the flood, and the Tower of Babel. Simple, simple things. Of course, the last part of the chapter is the life of Abraham, the life of Isaac, the life of, life of Jacob, and the life of Joseph. And when you study those and you look at those and you read those, it's amazing how God reveals to us part of his plan for the whole thing. See, God's not bound by time like you and I are. God gives us the whole picture, and he shows us many things from the very beginning. When man fell in the Garden of Eden, even back then... Watch this. It didn't catch God by surprise. It didn't back him into a corner and say, oh, no, what am I going to do now? They, they messed up. Huh? We've got to come up with a plan, Jesus. Uh, We've got to come up with a plan, Holy Spirit. We, no, no, no. God already had a plan for the foundation of the world. Book of Revelation tells us already, already. See, that's the kind of God we serve. That's the kind of God that saved me. That's the kind of God that's keeping me. See, he already had it figured out. And so when it happened, he already had a prophetic promise coming. Genesis chapter number 3. Now look at this. The Bible says, I will put enmity between these, talking to the serpent, God is, who beguiled Eve and Adam, and uh, they fell. They disobeyed God. He said to the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now in that, if you look at that verse, you'll see, of course, a prophetic statement that God makes way back there in the fall in the Garden of Eden. What was that prophetic statement? Her seed. Because a woman don't have a seed. But that seed was, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. You see, that's why it's so important, the virgin birth. Now, I'm not preaching on that today, but I'm just showing you the first, of course, of the promise was a promise coming. And then, of course, you come to chapter number 12. The end of chapter 11, you actually find Abram mentioned. And then when you come into chapter number 12, these verses we've read this morning, you find the promises of a covenant. God is showing himself and how he wants to show himself to the world. And he shows himself in a man called Abram. Now, God is reconciling himself with man. He's showing a beautiful picture of redemption and love. And though, though God would have been justified in wiping man off like he did in the flood, but yet he's going to show himself in a beautiful picture of calling out 
a group of people and showing and revealing to them his picture of what he wants people to be and how he wants them to live and a life of holiness. And then he's going to reveal his love through them, through a generation of people, uh, through a, I guess, a group of people, not a generation of people, through a group of people. And he's going to make them a promise. And he starts with one man. This man's name was Abraham. And this covenant that he makes with Abraham has promises in it. Now, once you see this, Abraham was an unlikely hero. Can I say it this way? Abraham was just like you and I before we ever got saved. Well, he was. He was a sinner man just like you and me. Some people think there's a spark of good in everybody, and that's who God picks out to save. No, no. God looks at cursed man, and he loves everybody. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We like to think Abraham was different. But when you read about Abraham, you study about Abraham, you find out Abraham lived in a pagan world. And Abraham was an idol worshiper just like everybody else around him. As a matter of fact, Joshua, the Bible uh, talks about uh, Joshua making reference to Abraham. And he says, Joshua said unto the people, Thou, uh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwell on the other side of the flood. In old time, even Tehran, the father of Abraham and the father of Nair, and served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and led him through all the land of Canaan. And multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. You notice what the Bible said in that verse? He said he was just like his father. He served idols just like everybody else. And God showed him grace just like he did me, just like he did you. If you're saved, hallelujah. Let me just share with that. That marvelous grace, that marvelous truth that God shows us there. And that, that picture of Abraham. You, you see, he was just like us. And God spoke to him. And God revealed to him that he had a plan for his life. And God revealed to him that he had a purpose for his life. And God revealed to him that he loved him. And he said, I've got something for you, Abraham. Will you listen to me? Will you believe me? And Abraham believed, even before his name was Abraham, he believed God. Hallelujah. I just want to have a shout and spell right there because that's where I got in. You know what? When I started believing God, God started doing something in my life. Oh, I'm telling you, have you believed God? Have you put your faith and trust in God? The Bible says, Titus chapter 3, verse number 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. No, 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 it's not any good that I have done. Oh, no, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. You see, that's what happened to me. It wasn't any good that I'd done. It wasn't because I was born in a preacher's home. It wasn't because I was born in America. It wasn't because I was a good little boy, because I wasn't. I was rotten to the core. Well, you wouldn't believe stuff I used to do as a little preacher's kid. Oh, Lord. Well, I got a red hot right here in my pocket, Brother Mick. I used to go over at Moody store and stick them in my pocket without any money as a preacher's boy. <coughs> Till one day Mr. Moody said, Put that up there and put a penny up there to pay for that candy. He said, what about them in your pocket? I looked up at him, boy. I thought I was looking up at the judge. And I said, what? He said, what about them in your pocket? You going to pay for them in your pocket? I just stood there froze. He said, you better go put them back. You want me to tell your daddy? I said, no, 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 no. Don't you let this happen again. Then I started go up walking the Roads with Coca-Cola bottles to buy that candy with. I knew better than try to steal it again. He'd catch me and tell my, tell my daddy. If he told my daddy, it was a, it was a bad day. Huh? I'm talking about four or five years old. We lived right, well, it was in the other county, but we lived on the county line. <laughs> it was right next door. Oh, you see, he got saved the same way you and I get saved. I believed God when God revealed to me that I was a sinner and I needed to be saved. And I got saved. Hallelujah. I believed God just like Abraham did. And God did a work in my heart. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto the land I will show thee. And you know what? When God 
speaks to us and we believe him, it's amazing what happens. It's amazing what happens in our lives. I've known that to happen in many people's lives. Oh, I'm telling you, God transforms us. He saves us. And then he does other things too. He calls us out. We're called out generation. We're called out people. That's literally what we are. We're called out from the world. That's what he told Abraham. I've known people to be called out to mission field too. I've known several people. I've got personal friends been called out. I, I've experienced that in my own personal life. I have personal friends and families in churches I've ministered in. I got called out. I have, I've known them. Boy, I had a, had a friend down in Cartersville. Man, he, he run a big business. I mean, a body shop business. Had several bays, fixing to add another bay. And God pricked his heart. Going to church with him. He said, I'm going to have to sell that business. Brother Joe, I said, you are? He said, yeah, God's called me to the mission field. And he sold that business, lock, stock, and barrel, him and his family, and he ended up going to the mission field. He ended up going to England. Stayed over there for years. His wife's health got bad, couldn't find the health care that she needed, come back here to the United States, and we support him today. His name is Frankie and Sandra Sheridan. Booming business. God called him out. I know another missionary personal friend of mine. I worked with him personally. I'm telling you, we went to church together, had good times together. He's in his 30s. I mean, he could have been a country music star. He's doing great, making great money. I'm telling you, before I was working with him, he was making great money working with a company. And God began to prick his heart. And God began to work on him. He said, I want you on the mission field. Why well, these folks, man, they've they done good to speak English. Hillbilly. <laughs> now, nah, like me, they, they're just old country folks. They love God. Raised up in Florida, living in Georgia, living in Rome. God called him. He started learning Chinese. Chinese in your 30s? Are you kidding me? It's a tough language. He left from here, him and his family, and went to Beijing, China as a missionary. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying he believed God. He listened to God. Oh, I'm telling you, that's wonderful. I'm telling you, God works in mysterious ways, but God works, you see. And the Bible says here that God gave Abram a promise. He gave him a covenant. And in this covenant, there's a promises in, in this covenant. Now, there's a sevenfold promises in this covenant. I don't know if you've ever seen it. I wish I had time to get into all the facets of this great covenant. I don't have time today, but look at this promise. The Bible said, I, I, now the Lord said unto Abram, go, get thee out of thy country from thy kindred to the father's house. And from thy father's house. And he said, unto the land that I will show thee. He said, I want you to go. I want you to separate yourself. I've got a promise for you, Abram. Sevenfold. Look at these promises. First, he said, I will make thee a great nation. Now, the problem is, at this particular time, Abram's an old man already. He ain't never had a child. So I'm going to make you a great nation, God says to him. And then he says, I will bless thee. I'm going to bless you, Abraham. And then he says, number three, I will make thy name great. I'm going to make your name great. Hmm. And then he says, number four, thou shalt be a blessing. You're, you're just going to be a blessing. You're just going to be a blessing, Abraham. Oh, I like that old song, Make Me a Blessing. You like that old song? I hadn't sung that song in years. Boy, make me a blessing. Make me a blessing. Out of my heart, may Jesus shine. Oh, out of my life, let Jesus shine. Just make me a blessing. That's what he did with Abraham. Make me, thou shalt be a blessing. Fifth thing he said, and I will bless them that bless thee. Somebody blesses you, I'll bless them. And then he says the sixth thing, if they curse you, he'll be cursed. And then he said the seventh thing, in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now, boy, if I had time, I could preach the rest of the day on that one. You realize what the Jews have blessed us with in the world? What has come from Jewish people? Now, it, it's called the Abrahamic Covenant. There are three basic elements in this Abrahamic Covenant. There's a land, a seed, and a blessing. 
In the land, of course, he said, go forth from thy country. Get thee out of thy country unto a land I will show thee. And God promised Abraham and his descendants a land that would belong to them forever. And can I tell you, it still belongs to them. Whether they're occupied or not, it still belongs to them. They still haven't occupied all the land that God promised them. But it still belongs to them. And God's still going to keep his word. It still belongs to them. And the Bible says here, he says that we call it the Middle East today, and that's a conflict that's been going on and will continue to go on. But, but God's going to keep his promise to his people. And then he talks about a seed, and I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee. God had promised Abraham that he would be a father to a great nation, and his descendants would be innumerable as the stars in the sky and the sands of the seashore. And this particular time, and then years later, he still hadn't had no kid. He'd come back and tell him that again. And he still ain't had a child. He said, man, you're going to be a descendant. Your descendants are going to be like the sands of the seashore. Your descendants are going to be like the sky, stars in the sky. you imagine that? Abraham believed God. 75 years old. And the Bible says when he told him that, in Genesis chapter number 22, the Bible describes him as good as dead. Now, can I say that in a way we can all understand it? What do you mean I'm going to have kids? <laughs> Ain't going to happen no more around here. I'm a dead man. And his wife, Sarah, you don't remember what she said when they, when they come back fulfilled, said that promise again to him? Sarah sitting outside the tent. She heard that. And you know what she did? She laughed. <laughs> Are you kidding? Abraham's going, what? He's going to father a child? <laughs> Are you kidding me? And they said, why don't you laugh? Why don't you laugh, Sarah? Well, 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 she tried to stutter and get out of it. Well, you, you, <laughs> that's a private thing. That's what she's trying to say. You don't understand. And the Bible said, huh? The Bible said they asked her about that, and she tried to deny it. But in reality, she knew. What she was saying in her heart said, are you kidding me? He's an old man, and you kidding me? I'm an old woman. <laughs> I done passed him years of life, too. You talking about us having children? You got to be kidding. But then the Bible says there's a blessing here. Thou shalt be a blessing, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. You recognize, of course, Abraham is recognized all over the world. Three major religions of the world recognize Abraham. Christians, Muslims, and Jews recognize Abraham. They recognize him. And, of course, Abraham has certainly been a blessing to a multitude of people. But, see, God's promised that Abraham's descendants would bring forth a Savior. That's the greatest blessing that God meant in this blessing of blessing the world. And he would bring forth a Savior through the descendants of Abraham, through the Jewish people. There would be one born that would Take away the sins of the world. Galatians says it this way. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Know ye not, therefore, that they uh, which are of faith uh, are the same as the children of Abraham, and the scripture and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. You see what he's saying there? He's saying God was already saying, I'm going to send a son through Abraham, and it's counted into his bank because he believed God. It's a counting term. Now, if you gave me a check for $100 and I deposited it into my bank, the teller performs a transaction. You know what I'm talking about. And whereby that $100, your $100, becomes my $100. A transaction. When that transaction is cleared, that money's in my account. That's what God done for Abraham. He took his righteousness. Abraham didn't have none. Hallelujah. And he put it in his account. That's what God done for you and I through Jesus Christ on the cross. Oh, I'm telling you, he, he, he took Abraham's guilt and he relieved it through all the guilt being put on the Son of God on the cross. I'm telling you, it's a wonderful, wonderful transaction that was made. Sometimes you get in trouble. I remember as a boy getting in trouble. I remember as a boy sometimes getting in trouble financially. 
And I'd go to my daddy, and sometime he'd help me. But sometime he'd say, we're going to have to figure out something else. Because I, my name, well, he didn't say this, but I said it. His name wasn't Gates. He didn't. He didn't have a money tree in his backyard. Some of y'all's grandkids think you got a money tree in the backyard. I have to remind mine there's not one out here. Going out here, nowhere. I've been up in these woods and ain't found one yet, Brother Johnny. If y'all find one, let me know. Uh, there's, there's not one. There's not one, see. But I want to tell you when it comes to God's righteousness. Well, I'm telling you, he's not limited, you see. I, 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 that's, a, that's a wonderful, wonderful reality. And the Bible talks about it. It started with a promise and then it's, it continues with a covenant of promises. A covenant that is filled with promises. I was morally bankrupt. Morally bankrupt. I had nothing within me. In order to go to heaven, you've got to be absolutely perfect. Do you know that? Do you know that? Do you realize that? Now, wait a minute, preacher. That's exactly right. There's no imperfections in heaven. How are you going to get in? How are you going to make it? Well, I'm going to keep the law. You can't keep the law. Matter of fact, there's some people on this planet that think they can, but they're lying to their self, and that's breaking the law there. <laughs> in reality, you can't do it. You see? God sent that law to be a schoolmaster to show us our need of Christ, to show us that Jesus died on that cross to pay our sin debt on the cross, that if we simply put our faith and trust in him, we've all sinned, we've come short of the glory of God. And that sacrificial death on the cross, Jesus dying for us on the cross, paid our sin debt. I want you to notice what Abraham did. He responded to God's call. And the Bible said the promises of this covenant. I wish I had more time to bring this out, but I want you to see this. Verse number four, so Abraham departed. Abram departed. So the Lord had spoken to him as the Lord had spoken to him. And, and Lot with him. And Abram was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance. And they had gathered and their souls and they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. You notice how the Bible puts that? He went through, he went on, just like God told him. He believed God. He put his faith and trust in God. They packed up and headed out. I'm telling you. They didn't have no Mayflower. They didn't have no U-Haul. They didn't have nothing else, but boy, they took off. Hebrews tells us he went looking for a city that had found, which hath foundations whose builder and maker is God. He's believing God. He's looking for that place that God has for him. And he found it too. Well, I'm telling you, he's looking. He's looking for that eternal promise. He's looking for what God has for him. He's looking for that unconditional promise that God had made him. Oh, I'm, tell, I'm so thankful. So thankful that God has made us some promises. Amen. You put your faith and trust in God. You believe him. And he'll make you a promise that's far beyond this world. Far beyond this world. Many years ago, uh, Karen's sister talked to us about she was making some future plans. We had talked about it several times, but we just never had done it. And we got to talking about it. And and uh, then the opportunity presented itself, and I got to talk to my mom and dad, and they were getting older, and got to looking at some things, and I said, yeah, we really need to do that. And she said, well, I've got a good lawyer. You can make out your will, and you need a medical will. You need a, a regular will and a power of attorney and those kind of things. I said, that sounds good, baby. Let's get that set up. I called my mom and daddy. You want to do it? Yeah, let's do it. I said, we'll do it. Let's get it done. Let's get an appointment. And we went down and had our meals, wills made out. You ever done that? If you hadn't, shame on you. Y'all do it, especially if you got kids. Y'all do it. I'm telling you, y'all do it. It's just well planning. It really is. If you don't, somebody else is going to have to take care of it. Oh, me. Y'all do it. So we did. Went down and had our meal, wills made out. Meals, wills made out. Huh. So we went down and had our wills made out, and we put in there that everything we had, everything we'd ever have, 
would belong to our kids. We didn't know what our kids would turn out to be. They were still teenagers then. I'll never forget the first time we went to Hawaii. Karen got on the phone with one of them. We was headed, our, headed to the airport. She said, oh, I forgot to tell them. Oh, oh, oh. And I said, yeah, you better tell them where the life insurance is, where the wheels are in case something does happen. I don't want them to have to search everywhere and not, not know where it's at because I had them stashed up somewhere safe. She got on the phone telling them. And then she told them this. She said, don't you be looking to me insurance policies. You'd not, you'll be praying for us not to come back. <clears throat> <laughs> they were teenage boys, you know. In reality, of course, she was joking with them. But we didn't know. But they're our kids, you see. Now, as they were growing up, we give them chores to do to earn money and different things. And sometimes they would do it, and sometimes they wouldn't. Sometimes they were in our good graces, sometimes they wasn't. But they were never out of, or never have been, out of our family, or never have been out of our will. Why do you say that, preacher? Because that's the way it is with God. See, God made Abraham a promise. And he made Abraham a promise concerning some things of value to him. of This land, and this promise of who he was, who he was going to be, and how he was going to bless people through him. And concerning a blessing toward his people and toward a curse of how people treat them. And the same thing is still true today, how we treat them. God still honors his promises, the promises of the covenant. And how he made this covenant, I wish I had time to bring this out. He cut, back in Abraham's day, they would cut, uh, it's amazing how they, how they drawed up a covenant. It's different than we bring up contracts. We talk about contracts. Every contract has a provision for how you break the contract. Every covenant has no such thing because there's no way out because there's no intention of ever breaking a covenant. You won't find in this covenant where God says, now, if you, if you don't do this, uh, we're gonna break the, I'm going to break this covenant with you. As a matter of fact, in Genesis chapter 15, you'll see where God sealed this covenant with Abraham and how they done it in Abraham's day when two leaders make an agreement, they would cut animals in two divide them down the backbone, and they would stake them out. And they would have the two parties walk down between the animals that were severed, that were cut open and hung out between them. And literally what they were saying, sort of like what we do in a marriage ceremony. That's why usually they sit on one side or the other. Y'all didn't know that, but you're learning something today. It's a covenant, really. It's what it is. It's an agreement that you're making. But in that, that covenant, they'd sever those animals and they'd set them out between them. And each party of that covenant would walk down between those severed animals and they'd look at those severed animals. You know what they were saying? May this happen to me, verily me, if I break this agreement. If I go back on this agreement. That's literally what they were saying. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 15, that when God made this agreement with Abraham, you know who he walked down between those animals with? A smoking torch. God let Abraham see a smoking torch representing himself, God himself. And he walked down between that, those severed animals with just himself. God made that covenant so real to Abraham, he said, there's no way I'm ever going to break this agreement. There's no way you can ever break it. I'm making it with you for generations to come, never to be broken. It's an amazing, amazing story. I wish I had time to bring it all out. Here's the last thing I'm done. The promises continue. You see, God's made us some promises. All of us who believe like Abraham did and put our faith and trust in God. The Bible says it this way. He talks about uh, the Jewish people, and he talks about them promises that he made to Abraham. You see, we see it in our modern generation. We see the people coming back to their land, that land that God gave Abraham, that very land. Now, you can look at it back in the book of Genesis. He, he tells him the boundaries of where the land that he gave him are. 
You can go back and study it. I don't have time to do it today. Maybe we'll do it later in a sermon. I'll show it to you. But he tells him, this is going to be your land. This is the land I'm going to give you. We call it the Holy Land. We call it the Middle East. We call it God's people's land. We call it Israel. And they don't even possess all the land that God told them today. May the 14th, 1948 is a pivotal day in history. On that afternoon, a car carrying Jewish leader David Ben-Gurion rushed down Rothschild Boulevard, Rothschild Boulevard in Tel Aviv, and it stopped at the Tel Aviv Art Museum at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. He got out and walked into that place where a bunch of press people and Jewish representatives and leaders were there, And from all over the world, people were assembled. He walked up to a podium at precisely 4 o'clock local time there, and he said these words. This right is the natural right of Jewish people to be masters of their own fate, like all other nations, in their own sovereign state. Accordingly, we, and he went on and said some other things, are here assembled, and then he said, and by virtue of the, our natural and historical right and the strength of the resolution of the United Nations General Assembly had hereby declare the establishment of a Jewish state, erect Israel to be known as the state of Israel. And thereby found in their land once again. And since then, people have been coming back to the home of Israel. 6,000 miles away, President Truman sat in the Oval Office, and he read a statement and signed his approval, saying at 6.10 p.m., one minute later, in the White House, Press Secretary released to the world another statement saying basically the same thing. We recognize Israel as a nation once again. Isaiah prophesied 740 years before Jesus was born. He said, Isaiah 66, Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day, or shall a nation be born at once? Prophecy. You see it? Prophecy. Isaiah said, how can it be? Can a nation be born in one day? It happened. May the 14th, 1948. And it started the clock ticking again. What are you saying, preacher? Secular Israel was born. And in the past seven decades, 8.5 million people from geographically all over the world have made their way back to Israel. And it's been blossoming ever since. The Hey, the desert has come alive. The desert has come alive. They've been occupying that portion of the land, and they've been, the Arabs have been fighting them ever since. But God's got some unfinished business there. You see, he's coming back to sit on his throne. The Lord Jesus is. Jerusalem. We saw it. I'll talk about it again in another message. Jerusalem has been moved. The capital of Israel has been moved to Jerusalem one day to be the capital of the world. What are you saying, preacher? Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The Bible says if we put our faith and trust in him, just as real, just as real as it begins with a promise, And it's continued with a covenant of promises. The promises continue to today. He's coming. Are you ready? It could happen today. Are you ready? Are you ready for his coming? Would you be ready if he come today? See, Jesus said in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. He's coming. If you're not ready, you better put your faith and trust in the Lord. You better believe him and trust him while you have opportunity. The Bible talks about it. If not, you'll be left behind. If not, you'll believe a strong illusion. Be damned. The Bible talks about it. Oh, trust him. Trust him today. I stand for prayer.
Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the truth we're seeing and what we've seen today, that you are a God of promises. You keep all your promises. You've never gone back on a single one of your promises. They're irrevocable. Lord, you are a God of your word. I want to thank you. We can not only live every day believing your promises, we can stake all of our eternity on your everlasting promises. I pray, Lord, if there's one on the sound of my voice that's never trusted you as personal Savior, this will be the day, this will be the hour, this will be the moment they would believe you and trust you as their only hope of heaven and eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. We're singing. If God's spoken to your heart, you need to come. You come. You come. God speaking to your heart. You need to come. Will you come now? Come on. Come on. appreciate your prayers, your presence, your attention. Sister Maddie is headed to prepare for baptism. I'm headed to prepare for baptism. We're going to baptize her today. Her family's here. Thank the Lord for them being here. Got some pretty girls down here and pretty girls back there. Hey, man, so glad y'all are here. You can be seated. We'll prepare for baptism. Brother Dale's going to lead us in another song, I think, or maybe sing one, whatever he wants to do, and then we'll baptize here in just a moment. Good warm water. <laughs> <laughs>